so far this semester, we've been focused on supervised learning. So we've talked about uh, classification approaches, we've talked about regression approaches, and now it's time to get into another area of machine learning called unsupervised learning, of which dimensionality reduction is one of the first key pieces. For a couple of the data sets that we've looked at so far, we've uh, actually had some fairly high dimensional uh, input spaces or feature spaces. So the baby kinematic data, we had something between 70 and 80 uh, dimensions. For the brain machine interface data, we had almost a thousand dimensions of input into our models. Now in a thousand dimensional space, the universe of all possible data samples does not generally uh, exist in a uniform distribution across that thousand dimensional space. And, and in fact, can be quite uh, compact relative to the size of that space. Furthermore, if we're trying to build models based on these high dimensional feature spaces, we really run the risk of uh, needing a tremendous number of uh, parameters in order to uh, define our, our models. And, and hence, we, we run into the possible problem of overfitting unless we sample a very large amount of data from the space. On top of these challenges, we also have this, the issue of intuition. In these high dimensional spaces, it's really hard for a human to look at uh, all of the features at once and really have good intuition as to uh, what's happening with, with those features. It's also the case that uh, some of our mathematical techniques that we've been using um, break down. And one of the implications here is that uh, our computational tools are not going to scale very well. One of the other factors that affects our computational tools is the, the fact that it becomes harder to fit our models and the necessary training data into a single uh, computer. So let's look at a, a very simple example. So imagine that our feature space fits within a, what they call a unit n cube, meaning that we have n different dimensions and along each of those dimensions, each feature, uh, those values can take on, can, can be somewhere between zero and one. Let's imagine that our features fall uniformly within this n cube. If we pick two points uniformly, uh, within, the, within the n cube, the, the Euclidean distance between the two uh, can become quite large. And in particular, as n starts to increase, this distance is going to also increase. It's also the case that as n gets big, that the uh, distribution of distances, so if I start picking uh, uniformly pairs of points and, I, and computing distances, and then I look at the histogram of distances, that histogram actually starts to become uh, quite uh, compact. What this means is that any two points in this space essentially look like they have the same distance from one another. So what this means is that the Euclidean distance metric may not actually have much meaning in a space like this with a feature distribution uh, of this form. And it's this Euclidean distance metric that actually is at the center of uh, a variety of the learning algorithms that we've been working with. So let's take a, a look at an example. Um, this particular picture actually comes from the Max Planck Institute. It is a map of the matter in our universe. And each of the points that you, you see in this picture corresponds essentially to a galaxy. And what's interesting about this uh, picture is that uh, galaxies are not uniformly distributed across uh, all of space. So those very bright spots that you see in the picture, those correspond to uh, relatively tight clusters of many, many galaxies. And in some sense, you can think of those, the, the brightest of those spots as really, so there's one right there, uh, as really corresponding to a, a tight uh, cluster. There's, it's also the case that you see a whole bunch of different uh, tendrils. So for example, along uh, this, this region here, there's this tendril that reaches up. Uh, and one can think of, at least in this 2D picture, one can think of this as uh, at least part of it as a line segment, uh, and more generally, it's really a curve. So, so matter is compacted onto 
uh, this curve, either right on the curve or very near to the curve. More generally, if we're thinking about three-dimensional spaces or higher dimensional spaces, uh, in this case, matter can be compacted uh, not along uh, individual curves, but can be compacted onto uh, small planar surfaces or curved surfaces as well. This idea that the data are concentrated in particular areas that we can think of as one-dimensional or two-dimensional uh, or, or some, some dimensionality that's smaller than the full dimensionality of our feature space, this is, these are referred to as uh, manifolds. So you're going to see this term uh, as we uh, move forward here. So with dimensionality reduction, the idea is that we're going to start with a, a feature space that is n-dimensional and a set of data that live within that feature space. And then we're going to re-encode these samples into some smaller m-dimensional space where m is a lot smaller than n. However, we're not going to uh, re do this re-encoding in an arbitrary way. We're actually going to do it in a way that, that preserves some, something meaningful about the spatial distribution of the points in our original n-dimensional space. We're going to continue to capture that distribution uh, in our smaller space. The challenge here, of course, is that we actually don't have any labels. We only have a set of uh, inputs. And so mathematicians, uh, machine learning uh, theory types have been developing a whole variety of different ways for us to take this step of going from high dimensional to lower dimension spaces. So there are a variety of different approaches to solving this dimensionality reduction problem. One class of approaches is this idea of uh, projection. So imagine that we're starting in a two-dimensional space and we have a, uh, a line segment or a curve that, uh, that, that is defined within this space uh, about which all of our samples are clustered near. What the projection approach says is let's take each of those uh, original points in the two-dimensional space and map them uh, to the nearest point onto this uh, one-dimensional manifold the line or the, or the curve. In the simplest form, these are literally just linear transformations. And, and this is the domain of principal component analysis that we'll talk about in a moment. But more generally, one can also take the original space, do a variety of nonlinear warps to this space before we actually take the, the projection step. And, and this gets us into uh, kernel based principal component analysis. Another class of approaches is this notion of uh, embedding. And, and here, what, what we do is we look at all of the, the, the points in our uh, data set and, and we can measure the distance between those points. And one distance metric is Euclidean distance, but there are other ones that we'll talk about. And in this space, some points are nearer to each other than, than others. And what this embedding process uh, involves is trying to find positions for each of the points in this m-dimensional space that res respects the, the nearness that we saw in the original n-dimensional space. And, and again, here, we're trying to achieve an m that's much smaller than n. So this gets into the domain of things like multidimensional scaling, uh, as well as uh, isomath, both of which we'll talk about here in uh, subsequent videos. So dimensionality reduction provides a, a variety of different advantages. Uh, so one of the things that we get out of it is that it makes very explicit the, the variance that we are seeing within the, uh, the data set that we have. So, so you've done a lot of work already with building correlation plots between uh, different features, and some features tend to be very correlated uh, with, with one another. And what we'd like to be able to do is explicitly capture those correlations in this dimensionality reduction uh, process. We also have a human aspect here that can be advantageous um, by reducing our dimensionality from many dimensions down to a few dimensions we have the ability to uh, start to bring back our visualization tools uh, 
that that works so well in in two, three, maybe four dimensions, but beyond that, it starts to get uh, hard for us to uh, really understand intuitively uh, how the points are related to one another. And if we take the right kinds of steps, and in some cases we have to be a bit lucky, uh, we have the opportunity to uh, discover uh, other relationships that uh, may not have been previously known by the domain experts. On the machine learning side, we can actually use dimensionality reduction as a pre-processing step before we start to build our models. Now what that means is that our models only have to deal with the M dimensions as uh, inputs as opposed to the original N dimensions. So what this potentially means is that the models that we build have, uh, have to have fewer parameters to express the models. And this means that we have the potential to dramatically uh, reduce the, uh, the overfitting that some of the models um, might be experiencing with, with our data sets. Because the representations of the inputs are smaller, this also means that the training times can, can be shorter and we can potentially fit much more data or more interesting models within the uh, computing facilities that we have. All right, so that's the big picture on dimensionality reduction. And the next step is for us to uh, start talking about this uh, case of uh, principal component analysis.